Uh, we are, of course, interested in Mises because we learned most of what we, or much of what we do about economics, we learned from Mises. Therefore, we were so much interested in Mises. So what can we learn from Mises uh, as a person? What can we learn from him? How can this uh, affect our life choices? Maybe how can we imitate Mises in certain respects? As we have learned from Stephen Kinsella, life choices are not uh, patented and, and copyrighted. So we are free to... <laughs> to imitate this and emulate Mises and apply this in our own lives. Now, clearly, one cannot imitate uh, the other person's lives. It's not, possible, it's not possible to relive Mises' life. and Of course, that would not be the point. We have to live our own lives. It's not possible, in, in most cases, to imitate uh, Mises' objectives or his vocation. That's what he really cared for and uh, was passionate about. That's not possible either. If you do not share this passion uh, in the first place. Now, fortunately for all of us, this applies. We do share Mises' vocation. We do care about economics. We do care about um, political organization of society. And plus, to some degree, we also share in his virtues, right, with the classical virtues, love, hope, faith, prudence, justice, strength, moderation. Mises said them to some degree. We have them too to some degree, different degrees. So we can learn about their relative importance by considering his life. We can also learn about how and when to bring them to bear. In short, Mises can be our model, at least to some extent. We are used to thinking of Mises as an intellectual. Of course, he was a premier intellectual. As far as the social sciences are concerned, as far as I'm concerned, he was the premier intellectual of the 20th century, probably, possibly of all times. But Mises did not just live the life of an intellectual. He was not a full-time professor of economics from start to finish. In fact, he was a professor only during a comparatively short time of his life. In other words, Mises confronted a situation that applies to most of us. He had a profession on the one hand and he had a vocation on the other hand. He had to earn his bread, his daily bread, with a activity that he was not necessarily passionate about. And this was then the basis on which he could engage in those activities that he was really passionate about, was the life of ideas. Now, this seems like a handicap, but in fact, it has also several advantages. Maybe uh, I should highlight one or two of them. I mean, the, the major advantage is obviously that standing in life somehow and not just living in the ivory tower of academics has the big advantage of bringing you in constant contact with that real world. Great temptation for an intellectual, for a pure academic, is to engage in exercises, games, and so on that are ultimately without relevance for the real world. That is, uh, intellectual activity becomes, uh, so to say, an end in itself. It becomes self-serving. This is what we actually see in uh, the economics profession, right, with a hyper-mathematization of economics, become an end in itself, so people specializing and develop ever more models, ultimately pointless. Uh, game theory would be another example. It's a nice intellectual exercise. It has, has sometimes certain pedagogical uses, but ultimately, in order to understand the world, it's perfectly useless. Another example would be um, uh, happiness research. Those who study economics have heard about this, so we were trying to measure the happiness of people, and then try to derive political conclusions from this is also perfectly <laughs> superfluous. This whole thing is, I, I won't go into detail. Right? So, but these are uh, outgrowths, right? These are uh, bad flowers in the swamp of academia run wild. And you don't encounter it ordinarily with people who have a day job, a daytime job such as Mises, and because necessarily they don't have so much time to waste. And if they spend any time on intellectual inquiries, it's about things that are somehow important for real human life. So these excesses that we find in economics, you find them also in other fields, music, uh, uh, physics, uh, uh, 
climate research, whatever, right? very often, so the stakes on a life on its own becomes divorced from the economy. So Mises can here be our model. It's, it's not actually a disadvantage to live both a vacation and a professional life. Just as we've talked about money this week, it's not a disadvantage that money costs a lot of money to produce. as a lot of production costs. Actually, one of its biggest advantages. Right? That uh, uh, silver or gold coins are expensive to produce. That's their biggest strength. So Mises lived a profession and a vocation. Let me just go through his major life stations. After his studies, so he studied until uh, 1906. That's when he got his doctorate. He started working as a legal clerk. He worked for a couple of, well, first he entered a public administration, the financial administration uh, in Vienna. That was the career path for those who really wanted to get to the higher echelons of the, uh, of the public bureaucracy, right? of the government, central government bureaucracy, like making a big career in Washington, D.C., and you raise up high within the State Department, I don't know what. So this was the way to do to go, Bimbavak did it, started in the very same administration. Bimbavak eventually turned out to be uh, the Ministry of Minister of Finance. So it was kind of customary, right, that the very promising young uh, pupils, students of the Austrian school, right, the most promising of them, they would start in the same administration and then eventually also rise to become a uh, high civil servant somewhere. For example, one of Bimbavec's students uh, was became uh, the president of the Central Bank. It would not have been unthinkable that Mises this way would have become the president of the Central Bank of Austria, which is difficult to imagine for us today, but uh, so that would have been the career path, or he could have become minister of finance. He did not, he did find this life unbearable. He just could not suffer the bureaucracy, right? So the inertia, uh, paralysis, to obey rules in all fields and so on, and later on he would turn this uh, experience into a, a, a magnificent theory of bureaucracy that, that contrasts uh, the logic of bureaucratic action to the logic of market action. This is his book, uh, Bureaucracy, that he published in 1944, was his first English language book. So he went on to uh, work as a legal clerk in a couple of law firms, and then starting in 1909, he became a consultant for the Chamber of Commerce in Austria. And so he, he remained until the outbreak of, uh, of World War II. Uh, in the year before the outbreak of World War II, he obtained his um, habilitation degree, that is, uh, a, a license to, to teach at a, a state university within Austria. So he started becoming a private lecturer at the University of Austria for a year and a half, approximately, until the outbreak of World War I prevented any further scholarly activities and had to, to join the army. And uh, uh, he had a previous training uh, as an officer, so he entered the, the war as an artillery officer and then started off as a lieutenant and then eventually became a captain. Now, within the war, he actually spent most of his time uh, at the front, which is significant because um, that was well, not by itself. Most of his former <laughs> student colleagues who had been with him in the seminar of Bimbavec and had attended the same lectures and so on, uh, they were not sent to the front but employed in um, uh, the various administrations of the war economy. Because Austria, during World War I, like uh, virtually all other countries, imposed on the economy a system of central planning. So you needed people to actually do the planning and then coordinate the different planning agencies. So that's what was handled typically by uh, graduates of uh, the economics programs. And Mises would have been first in line because he had just defended uh, a brilliant, brilliant book, The Theory of Money and, and Credit, had published this and was a well-known expert in monetary affairs. So he was suitable for employment in such agencies, much too good to the send to the forefront as cannon fodder, but he was nevertheless. So I will come back on this later. He survived the war. That's a great and fortunate accident for all of us, because otherwise we would not be here. He survived the war. He then became an ex executive of the Chamber of Commerce, and started lecturing as a private lecturer. That is, meanwhile, he had become an adjunct full professor, an adjunct uh, 
professor at the University of Vienna, started lecturing in economics, but was, was non-paid. So he gave a seminar and gave a lecture. Uh, and so there were some interactions with students. Then finally, in 1934, he gave up his, his uh, full-time position at the Chamber of Commerce and became a professor at the Graduate Institute for Higher Studies at the uh, University of, of Geneva in Switzerland. So this was the only time in his life when he was actually a full-time professor from 1934 to 1940. But even then, when his, his position was somehow uh, fragile because he was on a one-year position which was only extended six times, six times in a row, and probably would have been turned into a lifelong position had it not been for World War II. And then his uh, situation in uh, Switzerland became dangerous. Right? The, the uh, Nazis were going after him. They wanted He was relatively high on, his, on the list of, of enemies. So he was one of the, it was apparently, it was apparently some sort of an attempt at, at kidnapping him in, in Geneva. So things were getting dangerous. And he decided to leave the country and go to the United States. So in the United States, he first survived for the first, first uh, four years approximately on a stipend of the Rockefeller Foundation, with whom he had worked already before in the 1920s and 1930s. Something equally difficult to imagine for us today, but happened in those days. And then starting in 1945, he became a visiting professor at the University of New York, New York University. And so he was on a one-year contract again, and this one-year contract was extended 23 times. And so Mises was visiting NYU for 24 years. <laughs> It's kind of the kind of visitors that you like. I come over and see me any time. Then he stays on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> well, the seminar was actually quite successful. So uh, Mises lived within the world of ideas, but not only within the world of ideas, right? His head was in the world of ideas, but not all the time. And his feet were always firmly rooted in a daytime job. And this was certainly one of those elements that give a certain coloration to Mises' works, which make them so interesting, so relevant for us today. And one of the things that we have underlined a couple of times during this week is that Austrian economics cares, actually, is, is, is distinguished by its realism. Realism by, of the hypothesis, realism of the, the actual actions, of the laws that we use to analyze reality, realism also in the, in the, the choice of the kind of questions that we raise and questions that we try to answer. And this is certainly, at least partially, a result of this particular life situation of Mises. So if, for those of you who, who uh, would like to engage in an academic career, but there's actually no university that would like to hire you, don't despair. You have distinguished predecessors. Right? The, the important thing then is, and this is, is the difficulty and also the art, right, is to somehow combine these two things. You need to find some suitable employment that makes it possible for you to also take part in this other life. This is something for which there are no general rules. Each one of us has to solve this kind of problem for himself or for herself. Uh, but it is feasible. Mises shows us that it was feasible. How did he combine this in, in the early years? Uh, he, uh, uh, he would typically work during the day, whatever, from, from was the office from 9 to 5, and then when you return home, where you would spend whatever, five, six hours, and sometimes even more, reading books and, and writing books. Okay. Of course, it's difficult to combine this with a family life. So if you ever get married, I, I would say, well, don't, don't do this, right? Don't try to, at least you wish a divorce uh, within, <laughs> within 12 months or something, right? So this, this is the way to go. Right? But Jesus, so he made this choice, he did not get married, at least not at that point. It's a choice that each of, and there's no general rule that we can infer from Mises' life. And it's difficult to say what is more important. Is it more important that we carry on our scholarly life, or is it more important that we get married, and then maybe pass on our passion for, uh, for Austrian economics and for, for ideas to our children? It's difficult to say. And it depends really from, differs from one case to another. 
So Mises made his choice. He never had children. And that's a tough thing, of course, eventually in life when you see that your friends do have children and they have grandchildren and so on. It's something that you will miss and that Mises certainly has missed. And he had adoptive uh, children, stepchildren from, from uh, the, the wife that he later married. But it's not quite the same thing. So it's a choice to make in one's life. So Mises made his choice, and this choice uh, allowed him to uh, spend his time on scholarship, whereas others would have spent it on their families. The life of uh, ideas is, of course, a life of learning and of curiosity. <laughs> the first temptation here, again, is uh, the, the, this life becomes uh, life on its, on its own, was an end in itself, and one of the... Uh, the forms in which there, there can be a degeneration is that this turns into a purely historical interest for ideas. And you can study, approach ideas from two points of view. From a practical point of view, that was Mises' thing, because he believed that ideas can be applied and should be applied, that ideas actually do uh, are instruments to understand the world as it is. But you can also, of course, uh, approach the study of ideas, let's say, as a as a gourmet in a restaurant, right? So you're tasting a little bit here and tasting a little bit there. Yeah, this guy thinks this and this guy thinks uh, the opposite. I don't care what's right. I mean, I just know that this guy thinks this and this other guy thinks that. You're happy with this. You can become a brilliant participant in salon discussions uh, and appear in, on TV and say, oh, you display all your knowledge and so on. But ultimately, it's fruitless uh, and sterile uh, knowledge. So Mises did not do this, right? He did not... Um, approach ideas as a historian would or as an idea gourmet would, but uh, he cared for truth. He believed that there was something like truth. It was of the utmost importance what the truth was. And this is what, of course, made him a very productive scholar. A historian of ideas is only an historian of ideas who just registers, this guy thinks this, the other person thinks that, etc., etc. Usually they don't produce any ideas on their own because they, are not, they do not care for truth, so they cannot critically analyze ideas. That's precisely what Mises did, and here we can learn a lot from him. So we would have failed in this week if we have just imparted on you a couple of concepts of Austrian economics and so on, and not something also of the spirit. What is important, what is really important, is to care for truth. It's not important to learn whatever the law of roundabout production, but to understand what the law of roundabout production relies on. What does it actually say? Maybe it's not correct. Maybe it needs to be restated. So that is really important. You should not just swallow ideas, but develop the ability and the routine to critically analyze ideas and care for truth. And that's what Mises did. And that's what preserved him from the typical professional diseases of professional academics. He did not grow indifferent to ideas. He did not make intellectual compromise. And of course he would not, and that's of course the worst sins of all, right, betray what he believed in, what he believed to be true, and just lie. It can be wrong. It can be indifferent. But at least in, the, in those cases, you recognize that there is a truth somewhere. But if you lie, of course, you recognize there's a truth out there, and uh, you, you deny it, and you oppose it, you, you betray it, which is exactly the kind of behavior that we see uh, quite often in... Uh, public institutions, without naming individual names, or we can say uh, certain IMF employees, or <laughs> I, I think of the, uh, the European Commission, and OECD, and so on. You have people who are very smart, but sometimes very well informed. They say exactly the opposite of what they know to be true. Just, for example, to get along. Just to cater to the, their uh, uh, political sponsors, etc., etc., so Mises would never do this. He cared way too much for truth. He loved truth. It's a, a true love of truth that prompted him to follow this love 
at several critical junctions in his career. I will go again through just a little list to give you a couple of examples. A couple of Mises career choices. The first choice came on very early when Mises started criticizing the historical school. Of course, you are all aware of this, right, that the Austrian school was early on involved in a dispute with the champions of the historical school. It was a discussion between Karl Menger in, in Austria and Gustav Schmoller and his followers in Germany. And the, the subject of the dispute was to you know, are there general economic laws that are true, independent of empirical investigation, independent of empirical validation, observation-based validation. Menger said yes, Schmoller said no. Now, the historical school was way more powerful, way more influential than Menger's burgeoning Austrian school. Menger had some influence, and he could build up disciples and so on and uh, get them onto chairs of economics social policy, etc., within Austria. But the, the historical school was way more important. And they even managed to get their guys on some of the few professorships within Austria. One of them was Mises' primary professor. Mises started off as a disciple of the historical school. And he wrote a first book uh, analyzing the relationship between peasants and landlords in his native Galicia, completely inspired by the approach of the historical school. So Mises went to the archives. He was uh, destined to do this kind of work because he could read German and Polish and also uh, and I think essentially that, that was the, these were the languages were required for, the, for this kind of work. And so he uh, uh, went through the um, uh, documents of the public administrations, etc., and co he composed this work based on administrative records. And it was praised by all the colleagues of his professor. So they were writing raving reviews, wonderful, very promising young man. And uh, this is another example of the fruitful work of our colleague in, in Vienna, Professor Grünberg, etc., etc., etc. So Mises was perfectly positioned. He was the only one in his age cohort who came up with uh, such a work so early on. He was the star in the Greenberg seminar. And he could have set out for a wonderful career, relaxed at, at some chair within the German Empire or within Austria, etc. Nothing much to think about. But Mises cared for truth and he saw the weaknesses of the kind of work he was doing. How can we infer causal relations from the study of archival records? We can't. All of this hangs in the air. And so, so this is the big weakness. Why? You know, I've been just making assertions, or sometimes when I don't make causal assertions, I've uh, just given the timeline, or I've just stated matter of facts, but that's not actually what we are interested in. We want to know causal relationships because only causal relationships are useful for us in future-oriented action. We want to know what we have to do now in order to attain certain objectives in the future. The historical school had no clue about this, about answering this, this question. So he turned away from the historical school and he turned away from an easy career. So much did he love this, his care for truth, that he would risk his career. His mother grew nervous. She became almost desperate when he eventually, after his studies, when he first entered the financial administration, then quit the job because he didn't suffer bureaucracy. He said, oh, this, this boy is hopeless. Where do we get with him? Well, another critical career choice was uh, at the onset of World War I. I mentioned before that Mises uh, was not, did not remain within the administration charged with the execution of the war economy. That he was, that he actually spent most of his time of, the, of those four years from 1914 to 1918 on the front. Why was that? Well, because he had the temerity to criticize war socialism. Before you remember the, the panel session that we had on, on monetary reform, then the, came, the question came up so, what's the second best? Or what do we do? Should we rather go for interest rate targeting or for uh, uh, money supply targeting? 
right, of, of, of price level targeting, et cetera, et cetera. And Mises, in fact, so applied to this case was to say, well, this is all balloony because it doesn't work anyway. <laughs> Whether they're price targeting or, right? So you say socialism, the problem is not how do we manage concretely the socialist economy? It just is wrong and it doesn't get us anywhere. We will lose the war if we do this. It's not just my little preference as, as a liberal libertarian, we would say today, economist, uh, that we, uh, they have a fetish for the free market. We are engaged in a war. We want to win this war, and we will lose it because we are wasting resources. It's precisely in a war when you need the market most. It's not then that you need the market least. Now, that was not very fashionable. <laughs> it was not very popular. Right, in the discussion circles, and when you so you imagine, so you're sitting there, and you're a younger economist, and so there's the ministry, uh, uh, minister of war is there, and the minister of finance, you come up with, with, with uh, such things. Well, it's not exactly what gets you high up in the war administration. So they decided, well, they could dispense with the services of this young man and send him to the front. And there the problem would probably be solved by itself. Some, <laughs> some enemy bullet. So again, I mean, so Mises made this choice not just in a uh, peaceful, calm environment. Okay, so he ran to an academic career, but there were still other career choices open. He also made this choice when his life was at stake. How much more value can you place on truth? There's not more. A few of us, of course, will or can hope to, to attain this degree of love for truth, and it would be unfair to ask this of anybody, but at least that's, that's a great standard to aspire to. Another career choice was um, his critique of post-war socialism in Austria. So right after World War I, socialist governments became supreme in uh, most countries in Central and Eastern Europe. In Russia, actually, there was a revolution in 1917, as you know, but there were also socialist governments, not just socialists as today, social democracy, but real socialists, communists, right, like the central planning guy, Ties and we shoot you if you don't obey, guys. Right? So they uh, were elected uh, in, in Austria, in Germany, uh, Hungary. There were real communist revolutions, violent revolutions, uh, also in Hungary and in, uh, in Bavaria. So Mises uh, then confronted his uh, former friend uh, and uh, fellow student in the Babadek seminar, uh, who had become uh, the, the, the chancellor of the, of the new socialist uh, government, Otto Bauer. And again, he could have played it easy. He could have benefited from his personal, good personal relationship that he had with Bauer. And in fact, he, he became a, an actual member of the government, right? He became a member of the State Department. So he said, yeah, and then other people would have just schmoozed up to, to Bauer and said, yes, this is a very good policy, and let's see what the second best is in this case, <laughs> and so on and so on. So that I might become then whatever, uh, not only the secretary of state, but you can go higher and so, so on in the administration. Mises wouldn't have this. Uh, he uh, actually he did the exact opposite. He spent one night after another for about a week discussing with Bauer and his wife and explaining to them the policies they had in mind for Austria, they had in store for Austria, that were about to be applied next month, would within a few weeks imply utter disruption of economic life in Austria, and a few days or weeks later lead to a revolution. And he managed to convince him. And that not only led to uh, the loss of his job in the, in the State Department, right, but also to a uh, breakup of his friendship with Bauer. Another career choice that is relevant is his uh, critique of inflation, of inflationary policies in Austria in the 1920s. Mises was among the most adamant opponents of uh, expansionary monetary policy that in those days, and he was an adamant opponent of fractional reserve banks. In fact, he, in his, in his book, The Theory of Money and Credit, as I told you yesterday, he uh, uh, called for uh, outlawing the practice of fractional reserve banking. So according to Mises, all additional issues as from now would have to be covered 100% by, uh, by base money. <coughs> now here too, 
Mises effectively close to himself, otherwise promising career options, he was asked several times to join the executive board of Austria's big banks. It's like if somebody asks you today, well, you, you, you can join. You can, you can rem remain a teacher at the university, give your classes there, but uh, please join uh, the board of Citibank or of Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan or something like this. Well, how many economists today, today's America, would actually say no in that instance? So I see you think about it, and I, I thought a little bit about the question. I didn't come up with a <laughs> with any name, right? And that is because uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a tough call, right? renouncing to income prestige that were associated with this. And Mises uh, renounced this because he didn't want to not want to become compromised by such a professional affiliation. I have two other examples. The first one concerns his stance on the methodology of the social sciences. As you know, because we've presented Mises' views a few times during this week, Mises held the opinion that economic laws, and more generally speaking, praxeological laws, hold true on a priori grounds. They cannot, not only they do not need to be validated or uh, refuted by uh, empirical demonstrations, but they cannot be so. They hold true on a priori grounds that is independent of our, of information that we gather through our senses and can only be validated and or refuted by purely logical means. Now that effectively closed all doors to Mises in an environment in which positivistic ideas came to reign supreme. That was the case already in Austria in the 1930s, but even more so in the United States after World War II. He was completely out of step with the profession. That was certainly one of the reasons why he was visiting NYU for 24 years. Right? I mean, you, you cannot hire such a dinosaur. Right? <laughs> it's impossible. Right? So this guy not only is out of tune as far as politics is concerned, but he holds some I mean, views that are laughable on methodological grounds. Right? But he held on to this, irrespective of what the profession or what, his, what the opinion of his colleagues was. And finally, after World War II, so he continued to live this life, this life of a scholar, at a relatively moderate income, until his death in 1973. And he did so, even though his pay at NYU was really moderate, uh, even though uh, he had lost his uh, uh, pension claims with his native Austria. Austria that is, officially, the, the pension claims still existed, but they were debased through the inflation that had occurred uh, during the war years, uh, and also because of uh, the fact that there was um, a foreign exchange control, so he could not repatriate uh, his uh, Austrian pension to the United States. So given this, most people would have looked for some some sort of uh, uh, profession that would allow them to, to gain more, more money, uh, even uh, at the expense of, of uh, the, the ideas that uh, they hold to be true, Mises could have become uh, a lobbyist for various industrial associations, and he was asked to do so, and always his association with these, association, well, these institutions ended because he could not uh, be a lobbyist, he could only be an economist, and this also reasoning from the overall point of view uh, and not just in the light of special interests. So what is evident in these choices is unusual strength. Clearly, few of us could do what Mises has done. But sometimes, we manage to make tough choices that, are, uh, that impose on us a price to be paid, either in terms of career opportunities, sometimes also in monetary terms, and so on, as far as I'm concerned, I'm always proud when I make such a choice. And sometimes you, to renounce you really a lot of money, say, ah, this was a great day. But of course, you're, <laughs> you're poorer than otherwise. Right? So, <laughs> right? so the point is, uh, right? Mises can serve as a model here. Right? It's probably impossible to, uh, to, uh, to attain this. And for some, maybe some might, might have greater strength and so on. But uh, this, is, this is a truly an inspiring uh, model as far as I'm concerned. Second, what we see here is unusual love. Why does Mises 
cares so much. I mean, it's not just for any kind of truth that he cares. It's, it's truth that is relevant from the point of view of society as a whole, from the point of view of the commonwealth. Mises cared for others. Not, I mean, sometimes among lefties, you have the tendency to care for humanity as a whole, but uh, right, they, they wouldn't give a dime to the beggar next door. Um, or help uh, spend uh, two hours with, with, with their children, helping them doing homework or something like this. Right? Is, well, humanity as a whole is fine, but when it gets down to individual persons, let's not be, let's not exaggerate, right? And, and that was not a, at all Mises' thing. Mises had time, and uh, he took time to, to care for others. Uh, Something that I discovered during my biographical research on Mises was that he would often place people who were difficult, who had find difficulties finding jobs, who would get them jobs, uh, helping uh, them, them out in, in that respect, giving money, uh, charitable uh, donations. He didn't brag about these things, but this was a, uh, was a big thing in his family, right? both on the paternal side and the maternal side. He just gave a lot of money to charitable institutions. And finally, it's a care uh, beyond one's lifetime. And, you know, the things that were relevant that Mises cared for were not just important for his own generation, they were important for all of, the, all of mankind, all the subsequent generations. We've already said before that when, uh, the fact that we are here today is due to the fact that Mises survived World War I, right? But the fact that we are here today is, of course, also due to the fact that Mises uh, did not care about second best options for monetary policy, then we would no longer care for him today, but that he was trying to hammer out a, a systematic economic analysis that can be applied for, to all times and all places. So in conclusion, Mises can be a model and should be a model for us that he taught us how to stand for what we believe that he also taught us to pay the price to attain that in what we believe. He taught us to love truth more than ourselves, even though we might not always follow him there, but you know, because we are too weak. But that's the ideal that he gives us. And he taught us to share the love for ideas in the classroom, but also in the family, and to pass it on. This is the great legacy of the, the summer university, and I'm, I'm glad to have been part of this with you during this week. Thank you. <laughs>